Hey friends, Mike Shea from Sly Flourish, here with the Lazy D&D Talk Show. This is a weekly show in which we talk about pretty much anything related to D&D. And boy, I've got an interesting list of topics today, and I'm going to start off with a hot topic. I This was a topic I almost talked about last week, but I really wanted to get my thoughts together on it. We have Here's a list of today's notes, and right off the bat, we're going to get right into it. I'm going to warn people on Twitch that moderation is going to be, the, the, the ban hammer is hanging high, so don't be a dick. This is not an area where I'm looking for a lot of debate and argument, and I'm certainly not looking for any jerkdom. So everybody, please be nice. If you're in the Twitch chat and you see somebody not being nice and I didn't do anything about it, yell at me and I'll do something about it. All right, so if no one is aware, the, the title of this is TSR, UG is the name of this, this topic, the TSR debacle. And I'll be honest, when I first heard about this, I didn't pay any attention at all because I'm like, I don't, I don't care, right? And the whole thing was, so if you want to learn all about this, I highly recommend checking out the article on, on NWorld where Morris talked about it. I'll paste that into the Twitch chat. And he also, Morris on the podcast that he did, Look at the ads on the N World podcast had a really good podcast where they dug in deep. Morris went through the trouble of transcribing the interviewing questions, and I'm not really going to dig too much in the details. So why am I talking about it all? I'm talking about it all because, well, I'll, I'll get into that. So when I first heard about this whole thing, the whole the whole thing was that Ernie Gygax, one of Gary Gygax's sons, recovered kind of the trademark to TSR and said, I'm going to make a thing with TSR. However, there already wasn't a company doing something with TSR that had originally held the patent or not the patent, held the trademark to it, but let it lapse. And Ernie Gygax grabbed it back. The interesting bit there is that Ernie Gygax was kind of in partnership with the original company. So it's kind of like he stole it, but not really. It's all above board, whatever. But it's like, I don't, you know, I, I heard all that and I'm like, who cares? And then the, the first thing was like, wow, look, everyone on Twitter is suddenly a trademark lawyer, right? And that's why I kind of wasn't interested. It's like, I'm not a trademark guy. I don't really care. And I, it's not like they said anything that was so interesting to me that I want to do it. But then I heard in one of my Discord channels about this interview that he did. I'm not going to link to the interview, but it's linked in the N World articles if you want to actually see the interview. And I, so I, I, I read the transcript that Morris had done of the interview, and I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me, right? Like, it is a, from a, from a guy publishing in this industry, it's a perfect benchmark case of things not to do. And what's interesting is, like, you can't get past the first answer to the first question, right, without immediately, like, going, what is going on? And then I found out later how much worse it got. That it, or not worse. It didn't get worse. But it got, like, it compounded, right? More and more stuff where, like, he doesn't know what's going on. But really, it came up, you know, the first, the first thing it came up. So what are we talking about? So the first thing he does, the first question that he answers, he basically says, like, you know, the, 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 the days of yore for D&D have gone away. And now there's a lot of people who are disparaging the old ways and dealing with issues like, you know, gender identity and then laughs and like waves his hand, right? It's the first thing he says, right? The first thing he says. And you're like, what are you, what are you doing, right? And so, you know, I have a bunch of publisher friends that we'd like to talk, you know, that's like my sewing circle where we get together and talk about all this stuff. We talked about it. And then some people said like, I know him, right? And he's not like a complete asshole, right? But that he's really surrounded by the wrong people. And that, you know, there's a lot of people who really adore the 1970s, 1980s version of D&D. They worship at the altar of Gygax. So they really are like, you know, close. They, they have this chance. I, well, I'll call them sycophants who are able to stay close to like Ernie Gygax because he's the son of Gary Gygax. And they really adored, adored the D&D of old. And many of these, some of these people, I don't know if many, you know, it's hard to say, but some of these people really think that like the quote unquote SJW issues are ruining the old school of D&D and that really he's just a product of his times. That is probably the nicest thing you could say. And the reality is like nobody, the, the, the guy who interviewed him didn't say, hey, first question, how do you feel about the gender identity issues of D&D, right? No, he brought that up first thing. He didn't describe a product. He didn't describe a goal. He didn't describe anything he wanted to say. The first thing he did was hand wave and laugh off gender, gender, gender identity issues in D&D, right? Like that is not, you're just a product of your time. See, that is something that's an agenda you're hanging on to and deciding that right now is when you're going to bring it up. And the first thing he does is, yeah, completely unprompted. The first thing he does is alienate his audience, 
right? Like he could have just not said anything and nobody would have said anything, right? He could have just kept his mouth shut and talked about his product, right? But he didn't. He decided that he's going to bring that up and he brings it up more than once and it just gets worse, right? Like he goes in and does this whole weird ass thing about Native Americans and he talks again about like wanting to fireball the people that have, you know, it's just, it's like read the transcript if you really want to get into the details, but it's just so cringy. And that's not even talking about like where he's shocked and shocked and horrified that Kickstarter takes a cut of your Kickstarter money or that you have to pay taxes on it, right? So it's clear like the dude does not have a handle on this industry at all, other than the fact that he managed to grab a trademark at the right time. But he's certainly surrounding himself with the, with the wrong sort. So, you know, that, that's part of it. So why am I talking about it? And I thought about it last week and it's like, well, everybody's talking about it. Do I need to, right? They already have other takes. But then I was thinking about it. And I'm like, you know... As a older middle-aged cis white guy who played back then, can I talk to other older middle-aged cis white guys who think back fondly on D&D and try to slice the onion between this going and saying like gender identity, ha, ah, we don't want that in our D&D, to like just paying attention to the way the world's changing and being okay with it and, you know, just trying to understand it. Right. And that's something I do. So one thing is like I don't talk about diversity issues in D&D very often. Right. I talked about things like the, the, the controversy about orcs and goblins. Right. Which I get and I and I understand. And I look at like, you know, at first I, I start off with like, I don't know, you know, is it really an issue about calling orcs evil? And then I read like the monster manual entry and you're like, yeah, that's pretty bad. Right? Why is every orc that, you know, a cave dwelling, you know, murderer? And why is every goblin you know, a little jerk. And you, and then you look at Eberron where they don't do that. And you're like, wow, this is so much better. So we can get out of that. So I talk about it that time, but I don't, I don't, I haven't talked about like a lot of issues of, of, of race or LGBTQ rights. And it's not because I don't support it. Cause I do. Right. I think this game has a wonderful opportunity to be a diverse game for everybody. Right. Period. And, and, and I think that it's very important that people have an opportunity to see themselves represented in the game they're playing. And it's a fantasy game where we can make the world a better place just by writing some words out, which is a lot better than we can do in the real world. So why not have, why not embrace that stuff, right? Why, why, why get angry about it? First of all, no one's coming into your game and telling you how to play. But second of all, like, God forbid other people should have an opportunity to see themselves in the game that we're playing. So this is something, you know, you see like a lot of the detractors, and I, I made the mistake of reading through Twitter threads on this, right? And it's, they say like, well, I don't want politics in my D&D. Transgender issues are not politics. LGBTQ rights are not politics. These are human rights issues, right? We, it's, it's so easy for us cis white guys to sit back and be like, oh, I don't want to have politics in my d and I don't want to deal with these issues. And that's because we're not, our lives aren't threatened when we decide which bathroom to go into. Other people, that, that's not the case, right? They, a, lot of, a lot of people are living in danger because of this stuff, because of their identity, just who they want to be. Right. It's not a matter of politics. It's a human rights issue. And I think that's that gets lost on on in, in these topics, particularly for people like me. Right. Where it's not my issue. Right. And it's not my life. And I'm perfectly happy. And I don't I don't I don't worry about which bathroom I go into or whether or not I'm going to get my ass kicked if I do. Right. Or whether yeah, I'm going to get called out. So, you know. So our RPGs are an escape for all of us. It's a chance for ourselves to see represented in RPG. And I don't know why we wouldn't embrace that. I don't know why we all wouldn't embrace that. An example was, another kind of example is that like 10 or 12 years ago in the middle of 4E or even like the last of 3.5 to 4E, we thought this game was going to die with the Gen Xers, right? We thought it was going to die with a bunch of, you know, old white dudes. And there was all talk about, wow, everyone's going to video games and we're, we're going away. No one is saying that anymore. That disappeared, right? And now we know the game has been handed off. And now it's much bigger than it ever was. Five times bigger on my loose calculation. Five times bigger than it was back then, right? And it's bigger than it's ever been in the history of the game. And why, why wouldn't we open that up for more people, right? So embrace, embrace that diversity. Or at least, at least as a, as a, you know, an older cis white guy, the very least you could do is keep an open mind about it, right? Don't let your mind calcify and fossilize into just one way of thinking and saying the world is this way and I don't ever want it to change. And I'm going to, I'm going to rebel at everything that comes along because you're not in the right place. So I'm going to end with my quote from the Dark Tower series by Stephen King from Roland Gilead, who says, you know, eyes open, mouth shut, see much, say little. Really powerful, 
really powerful, right? Keep your eyes open. This is what I try to do. The reason I don't talk about this, there's two reasons I don't talk about this a lot. And one is like, is it my place, right? Like, again, I'm an old cis white guy. So what do I do? I, I try to listen. I, I, I listen to people. I try to understand the situations. I keep an open mind. I recognize that the value of diversity in the gaming is making the gaming better. There are areas where I'm like, eh, an example of like removing alignment from all monsters in d and I'm like, eh, but you know what? Like for me, it's, I'm, that isn't killing the game for me. And in the meantime, it may open the game up for other people. That's important, right? So I don't, I don't, I don't discount it. I, I don't discount it. I, I'm, I try to keep my eyes open and think about the other side of this. I try to empathize with everybody, right? Like try, just try to understand and recognize like no one's coming after you. No one cares, you know, like no one's thinking about you at all, right? Like, so don't worry. Like no one's putting you on the spot and making you do things. No one's thinking about you at all. Keep your eyes open, empathize and think about it. Right. Surround yourself with the right people that can help you keep this open mind. Right. So that's why I thought it was important to talk about the Gygax thing, because it was such a clear example of somebody who just let their brain fall into a trench and decided, made the choice. And I don't you know, there's a lot of like conspiracy theories like, oh, he did it so that he could build that segment and build an audience up with the, with the, what I would call the wrong sort. I don't think so. I think he's just an old guy who said said stuff, but it's clear that that was on his mind. Right. And so I kind of go back to the top, which is it kind of doesn't matter. It's a really small company. If they ever put out a product, I'd be really surprised. You know, given given his statements like Kickstarter, I don't think you're going to see a Kickstarter. And in this industry, there is such a thing as bad press and he got it. Right. And I don't think I don't think that's ever, you know, I don't think that's ever going to I, I would be surprised if this thing doesn't go away. But in the meantime, that's not the important part. The important part is, as you know, many of us and I think many of my audience, right, who are old cis white dudes keep an open mind and 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 embrace embrace the fact that our hobby is not dying right our hobby is exploding and there's lots of opportunity for people to see themselves in it okay that was topic number one so i did a poll on twitter and it has 1500 votes it still has a day left on open but 1500 means it has hit the central limit theorem it's not likely these results are going to change by they might change by two or three percent but but not really and I did this as a follow-up to the conversation about the Mercer effect. And a lot of people who talk about the Mercer effect bring up the fact that, hey, Joe Kupski is here. Hey, Joe. They bring up the fact that they're professional voice actors and that that gives them an edge that a lot of DMs don't have. So then my question was like, well, how important is that? How important are the voices of NPCs as a skill of DMs? And I said, I'll put up a poll and I'll put up four questions and I won't, I won't, I won't let replies, mostly because I don't want a bunch of people saying, you know, telling me how my poll is wrong. I, you know, again, like I just don't have that kind of time. So just answer the poll or move along. And so the question I had was, I came up with the four answers and I, what, the way I expected was I expected roughly 85% would say it's not very important. And then fi about 5% for each one. That was my hypothesis going in. One key to polling is put a hypothesis down before you actually get answers so that you're not harking. Harking is a hypothesis after the facts, after the results are known. And it means that you build stories around the data when in fact you should start with the story and then see if the data supports your story. And if it doesn't, then you do a new and you, you create a new story from scratch and then get new data to support that story. That's how science works. Science does not work with get data. You know, the scientific method, you say, what a novel idea, right? That the, the scientific method is start with your hypothesis and then find data to either support or, or, or not support it and then move on. What you don't do, which many people do, which I have done many times, is you just ask the question, you get the answers, and then you build a story about why that's true or why it's not true. Right. And that's that's called harking. It's, it's a fallacy in science. So now you learned a little science today. So I expected that it was going to be 85 percent said not very important and then five percent for the other three. And I was wrong. And it turns out it's a little more important than I thought it was. So I, I, I was in the other direction. I expected that I expected that most players really don't care. Right. And that the. I also expected that DMs overweighted it as a skill. And that may still be true because I don't actually know how DMs feel about it. And maybe I'll put up another poll in a few weeks when people have forgotten about this one. I'll put up another poll and ask DMs, how important do you think players see voice work and see if it differs from this, right? And because I my, my hypothesis before I have run the science, before I run the poll, is that DMs think it's more important than it actually is. And we'll test that. But I got one half of the equation here. And one half is that 
It actually is more important than I thought it was. It, it, it isn't somewhat important. So the answer is nine out of 10 players feel that voice work is somewhat important or less, right? Only one out of 10 believe that it's important or very important, right? So that's kind of interesting, right? That one out of 10 thinks it's important, very important. Again, that's actually kind of what I expected. I, I just didn't expect that more people were going to do somewhat important. So what does that mean? It means, you know, it's somewhat important, right? It's maybe it's somewhat important. Three out of 10, three out of 10 think it's somewhat important. And then, yeah, but, but you know, six out of 10 or, you know, don't. So I think there's other things. I think there's other areas that DMs can improve more so than improving your voice acting stuff. There's a lot of things you can do to make your, to, to, to do voices. I agree. Just do it, right? Just make up voices. Just work on it. But listening to audiobooks is a good one. Listening to, you know, if, I bet if you listen to like radio drama, I bet that works really well, right? I bet, I bet, I bet radio drama is really good. So, you know, give it a shot. And one part is just let yourself be a fool, like right? let yourself act like a fool and, and you're in a better spot than if you're not. I like to do voices. I like to do meta meta voices so i'll get like into the voice of the lich and then i'll talk about i've i've still got three spell slots left how many eight d6 yeah it's a lot of damage i'm gonna do that so i will meta game in character because it's funny so you know yeah so i thought that was an interesting result and i think that ties into the mercer effect thing i would i would still say you know it hasn't changed my mind that we don't have to worry about the mercer effect too much just find players you that like you what you do find players you like playing with and run games and don't worry about it so much you know just try to, there are other ways you can be a better dm and not worry about whether or not you're up to the scale of matt mercer so that one all right let's talk about some third-party products so i have two third-party products that i wanted to talk about today and i've been trying so what i'm the reason i'm doing these previews and these are really it's not really a review it's a it's kind of like a a, a quick look right and a quick look at a recommendation. So one thing about these previews is I'm not going to review and I'm not going to put anything in here I don't recommend. I recommend everything that I'm doing these reviews of because there's so many products I don't have to bother with where I'm not, I'm not going to talk about them. And it doesn't mean that if I saw a product, I don't like it or that you don't see a product here, you don't like it. One of the things I want to do with these previews is I want to, you know, I, I talk a lot about the fact that third-party products are as good as the Watsi products and we should treat them as much as we're, we should weight them as heavily as we're weighting Watsi products because they're really good. And that's true. And I also want to kind of bring some attention to products that might not otherwise get the attention. So I, I, I can say that I'm typically not going to be showing a lot of stuff from the two publishers that I'm about to publish or that I'm about to talk about because both are already really big. Cobalt Press is the number one third party provider for fifth edition products. They make tons of them. So they don't need my help and they don't need a spotlight. However, I think that uh, this book in particular could use a spotlight. And I think that this one, that both of the products I'm talking about today have similarities that I wanted to talk about. So I would not, I'm, I'm going to, I'm probably going to end up reviewing a lot of Cobalt Press and a lot of Monty Cook Games stuff. I already talked a lot about Monty Cook Games before and Cobalt Press, everybody knows. So, but, I, but I'm, I'm going to try to make an effort to say, let's go below that, you know, below, right? But we're going to look at smaller publishers than those as well, because we already know how awesome Cobalt Press is, right? And we already know how awesome Monty Cook Games is. But today I'm, I'm going to be previewing two books, one from Cobalt Press and one from Money Cook Games. And the first of them is Empire of the Ghouls. So Empire of the Ghouls is written by my friend Richard Green. Richard spends a fair bit of time in the Sly Flourish Discord. He's an awesome dude, an awesome designer. And I'm, I'm, I was excited for the book and I, I'm excited now. It is, and, and right off the bat, it is an excellent book. It is a big book. It is 355 pages for an adventure. It, I, I have the hard copy card cover, and you can buy the hard cover from the Cobalt Press store. They have it in print now. And it's a pretty reasonable price. I think it's 55 bucks for the PDF and the book, which for a small print publication is, is really good. It is a wonderful book. And... We were talking about Storm, uh, Storm King's Thunder a little bit earlier, and it kind of it, it, it fits that style in one way, which is it has a lot of material in here just from a campaign perspective, just understanding the Empire of the Ghouls. So the cool bit about the Empire of the Ghouls is that Wolfgang Bauer, when he had first invented the or first thought up the Empire of the Ghouls, I think it was him that in, in, in thought up the Empire of the Ghouls, was that like if you're going to have these like races that are underground where it's like hard to find food and stuff, wouldn't the dominant race be one where they're undead? 
right? And in particular, like instead of vampires, what if it were ghouls? And so he came up with this idea that what if you had a ghoul empire where you didn't just have a bunch of ravenous humanoids running around eating people, but instead had an entire society and had a ghoul king and had, you know, a, a royalty and all of this stuff, dar ghouls and whatnot. And that's been a big piece of Midgard. It's in the Midgard campaign book and it's in, and now he's got this giant 355 page campaign adventure. And it's, it's huge, right? It's a great big book. But an interesting thing is that it was led by and, and primarily written by Richard Green, one author, right? And, and that is kind of a different way that adventures are getting done than Watsi's adventures, which now have lots of authors. We'll see about which light. I don't know about which light, but the other ones do. So that is a really interesting way to handle it. Uh, the other thing that makes this one different from other Cobalt Press adventures, so Cobalt Press has a bunch of smaller adventures, but like the one that they had done right before this one was called Margreve, right? The Forest of Margreve. And that one was actually a bunch of one-shot adventures kind of put into a book about a big ancient forest. And it's a good book, but it's not a campaign adventure. It's really one-shot adventures inside of an ancient forest. And then a campaign book about an ancient forest, which was fine, but it wasn't exactly what I expected it to be. Empire of the Ghouls, on the other hand, is a real full adventure. It is a, let me go back to my notes so I can kind of hit the, hit the highlights. It's a one to 13 adventure. It is more episodic. It is not a yam shaped adventure. It doesn't have sort of like an initial couple of adventures that get you started and then lets the players kind of go in different directions. Like we see in Watsi adventures, sometimes really well, like in Tomb of Annihilation, other times not so well, like in Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, right? Or, or I guess, yeah, even, even Descent into Avernus would be another, another one that's sort of a yam shaped adventure that didn't really work out. So this one, if you're used to like the Pathfinder, what do they call them? The Pathfinder Adventure Paths, this, this is more similar to that. It's got big chapters and it cover, each chapter sort of covers a big piece of the adventure and the players sort of go through each of these chapters. It doesn't mean that there's no decisions or important decisions that get made, but it means it doesn't sort of expand out into like explore the Underdark. Like you could, you could think of this book similar to Out of the Abyss in that they're both like Underdark adventures, sort of, but there's a big difference in this. So this one really starts in an overland. It starts off in the city of Zobek. And it has, a, I think, a couple of adventures, a couple of the initial adventures start off in overland stuff. And then slowly you figure out the plot that's going on and you end up going down into uh, the depths and into the, the, the city, the city of Vandekul, 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 I can't pronounce it. And it's really like a world tour of Midgard. I asked Richard on, on chat, I think yesterday evening or this morning, or one for one of us and one for the other, like, well, what do you want to highlight from this? And he said, there's two things I want to highlight. I think he brought up two things that he wanted to highlight. One is that it's really meant to be like a primer for Midgard. And I think that's mostly true, but Midgard is so big. It certainly covers both overland stuff and gets down into, into the, the, the sort of underdark of Midgard. But there's a lot of Midgard that like you can't cover in a book that's got this one big campaign. But that, that sort of like rapid tour of Midgard, if you want to see what Midgard is like, you know, this is a good book for it. The other thing he wanted to bring up is the fact that there is a cool map in the back. I'm going to I'll pull it out now. Uh, that's easily missed. Where is my map? I don't know. I think I, I stuck it somewhere else. I think it's stuck in another book. I already pulled it out of this one. So he said there's a map in the back of the book that's easily missed. Oh, no. Oh, no. Is it there? Yeah, I think I already pulled the map out because it had a little sticky thing. I don't know where I put it. But there's a map in the back of the book that shows like the whole build of the Undermount. I, I would, I, I bet you it's in the PDF. Let's see. Let's jump to the end here. You know what happens when I jump to the end of a giant PDF. So we'll see. Look, play testers. Big piles of play. Look at all those play testers. That's hard to do. Play testing is hard, hard, and yet makes really solid adventures at the end. So when we think about that idea of like how much money went into making a book like this, right? How much effort and money and art and design and just, you know, blood, sweat and tears went into this. And we can pick it up for like, I think it's $20 for the PDF, 55 bucks for the PDF and the hardcover. And that's a meaty hardcover book. We're getting a steal. It's a steal. I really hosed up my browser. Oh, there it is. Let's see if I can find the map. There it is, right? So it's got a paper copy of this map that shows the entire, look at this as like a point crawl, right? Fantastic point crawl map. You could just use this on its own and make up your own stories if you want, but why would you? Because there's a big map, right? So really cool, really cool map that's in the back of the book. 
uh, the back of the physical book. They they also sell a VTT pack, so you can buy a VTT pack and put it all into. I think they even sell like a Roll Twenty version and a Fantasy Grounds version, so you can buy it for your the top two VTTs, or you can buy a VTT pack that has all the maps ready to go. As part of the Kickstarter, I got I got that I got that as part of the Kickstarter. What else do we want to say about it? So it's just packed with stuff, right? It's got NPCs, it's got new monsters, it's got a really cool. You know, I, I'm I'm loath to kind of scroll up because it hoses up my browser when I do. Yeah. I love random encounter tables like this where like you have sort of different areas, Badlands, Desert, Tundra, Undercity, the Ghoul Imperium, and you roll a D100 and then it tells you of these 50 or so encounters and then has these one paragraph encounter descriptions. This is something that I did in, in my, my adventure book, Runes of the Grendel Root. It's something that you see in some other published adventures. It's something you can really only get away with in a great big, a great big book like this. But I, I really think it's a fun way to take a published adventure. And I guess, so I would be, I would not be surprised if when I talk about the yam shaped adventure that when you're exploring the underworld when you're when you're going through i bet you there's lots of room for side side quests and side adventures along the way so so in that way i don't you know i might have been wrong in saying that it's just this kind of purely linear linear style adventure path so dark fantasy role-playing world so what the only critique i can make of it is that in a I, i'm swimming in a sea of dark adventures i ran descent into avernus i'm running rhyme of the frost maiden and, you know, I, I don't know that I'm ready to run another big, dark campaign adventure. I think, I bet you it's cool as hell. And I'm waiting for the time to run it. Right now is not that time because I need more fan, fantasy and whimsy. But that's not a complaint against the book itself. It's just timing and me, right? But for lots of people, I think this would be a fantastic adventure to run. I would highly, I would, I haven't run it. So, so here's, this is hard to say, right? But I'm going to say it anyway. It would not, I, I, I would, I would consider running this before I would consider running Descent into Avernus or Rime of the Frost Maiden, right? I would, I would probably, if I could go back in time, I might have dumped Rime of the Frost Maiden and tried out this instead, given what I've been doing with Rime of the Frost Maiden and the pain in the ass it's been. I would have given this a shot. I don't know that it's better. I think so. It reads great and it looks really cool. And I bet you it doesn't suffer the same problems that Rime of the Frost Maiden has. So Yeah. Anyway, I recommend it. The PDF, 20 bucks, 55 bucks for the hardcover and PDF. Lots of different accessories, map apps. There's also like a, a Lairs book too, I think I think they have. Yeah, so there's, there's a whole bunch of like M, uh, Empire of the Ghoul accessories that they have on, on the Cobalt Press store. And I think one of them is a is a Lair, a book of a book of like underground Lairs that you can use with this book. So in that way, you can really expand it out and build it into a, a bigger thing. So really cool. So I love it. So the other book I want to talk about, I think I've talked about everything with Empire of the Ghouls, Bing, is Where the Machine... Oh, I should I should put a link, right? So here's the link to the Cobalt Press, the link on DriveThruRPG for the PDF. And I have a link to the hardcover and PDF, which you can get on the Cobalt Press store right here. Those are pasted there. If you're watching on YouTube, they're in the show notes below. The next product I want to talk about is Where the Machines Wait. This is a camp a small campaign adventure written for 5th edition by Bruce Cordell and published by Monty Cook Games. I am a huge fan of Monty Cook Games. And and like Cobalt Press, they are a big publisher with with, you know, a lot going on. And they produce just beautiful, outstanding products. They had a Kickstarter for a book called Arcana of the Ancients, which was a, Arcana of the Ancients was a, how to bring their science fantasy world of Numenera into D&D. And really good book, really, really fun stuff. Had a little bit of problems, which I think, I think also exist in this that I'll talk about, which is that it, it tends not to follow standard 5e design principles. It sort of goes off on its own in some cases, and in some cases, things aren't gonna work as well as you would hope. And a lot, it takes a lot of experience with 5e to kind of recognize that like, you don't wanna give advantage all the time with like a magic item. But Arcana of the Ancients, which I have sitting right here too, this is also a great book. I've already talked about it on this show before. Big hardcover book, lots of really great stuff, and a fun, I used it for my Eberron campaign. If you want to add science fantasy into your D&D, there is no better book than, than this one. And I think it was part of that Kickstarter 
one of the stretch goals was that they were going to do an adventure book. And so they did uh, Where the Machines Wait. Now, the interesting thing is that it uh, also, like Richard Green having written Empire of the Ghouls, this has one author, uh, Bruce Cordell. And Bruce Cordell has been writing D&D adventures for like 30 years, right? He's been doing a lot of D&D adventures. And like all of the Monty Cook products, it has tremendously beautiful design Gorgeous artwork. Their art, you know, whoever, like, like, you know, their art, their art director, Bear, Bear Waiter is their art director. Gorgeous stuff, right? And the book is really, they built for usability. They have like sidebars here that kind of point to other books and other pages and stuff like that. And the premise of this adventure is that there is an ancient, an ancient city, an ancient technological city buried underground where ancient machines still lurk. And it's mostly a, a, an adventure of exploration. And this is something that Numenera and, and Monty Cook Games tends to focus on, is they're real big on exploration. If you want to understand like how exploration can be a main driver for a game, Numenera and their related products definitely are, work that way. So what's kind of interesting is you could sort of take this adventure and put it anywhere. And I was thinking like, what if I took out Yethrin in Frostmaiden and replaced it with this guy, right? That might be an interesting way to go. So that's something I am considering. It has, you know, if you want, like, look at that, look at that art, right? Like, you want fantastic art. This one's got fantastic art. Almost for the art alone, it's worth it. It's just, it's just gorgeous stuff. And so the whole thing is that you're exploring this, like, ancient city, you know, called the Grave of the Machines under, under, under the Earth, right? And it starts about fifth level. One, one thing that I found a little difficult with this one is that it starts at fifth, but I have no idea how high it goes. And I know there's, like, things later on that are really, really powerful. Uh, yeah, 30 bucks for the print copy, 12 bucks for the PDF, and it has a free preview and beautiful production. Just, it's a, it's a, it's a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous piece of work. It is significantly shorter than Empire of the Ghouls, by the way. It is only 96 pages as opposed to 360 pages or whatever. But it includes the same kind of stuff. It's got a whole pile of new monsters. Many of the monsters that are in here are in other books, so you can pick them up in like Beasts of Flesh and Steel and stuff like that. But it's nice to have them in the book. And again, gorgeous, gorgeous artwork. And it's a multi-chapter adventure where you are essentially going down into the depths and exploring this area and then dealing with NPCs that already live there and stuff like that. So really neat, you know, we've got, again, random, random encounter tables, you know, just really good design. And, and I, I just always find it sort of awe-inspiring. And like, yeah, you look at this, like, look at the, the lost city, right? And imagine, I mean, I think that this could be plugged in for Yethrin really easily. There are parts about Yethrin I'm not crazy about in, in Rhyme of the Frostmaiden. And I think it might be really cool to add this stuff in. The only tricky bit is that my players, Joe, I don't know if you're still here. My players have already seen a lot of this stuff because I used it in Archon of the Ancients. So I'd have to reskin a lot of stuff, but I think I could do that. I think it would, I think it would work out. So really, really cool, cool book, cool adventure. I really dig it. And I, and I, I highly recommend it. I think it is a, you know, I, I, I think I'm, I'm happy with everything I've picked up from Money Cook Games. And I've even picked up like three different versions of Numenera. I picked up like the original book. I picked up the box set. And then I picked up the two, the two books. What is it called? Numenera. I don't remember. But there's two big uh, ones about building cities and the other one's about going off and exploring. And I bought that Kickstarter too. So I basically bought Numenera three times and I don't care. It's gorgeous. So Destiny and Discovery. Thank you. Numenera Destiny and Numenera Discovery, which are both fantastic books as well. Sort of, it's not really their second edition, but it's sort of like a revised version of Numenera. And uh, hey, my mom is here. Hi, mom. Happy fourth. Is it the fourth today? Oh my God, it's the fourth. Yeah, I've been so busy. So if you dig, if you want like a cool underground science technology, or science fantasy city to place underneath your campaign, you could do far worse than picking up where the machines wait. And I, I highly recommend it. And I recommend Monty Cook's products overall. So I have talked about that. So another interesting thing that happened this past week. Yeah, Eberron. It'd be, yeah. So like, it's funny when this came out, because this would have actually been a really cool thing to put underneath the city of making in the Mornland, right? Like this, the, the, I don't want to spoil too much from here. But you could take, the, the central plot of this is another weapon of mass destruction. That weapon of mass destruction could have been the thing that caused the mourning. And it could be the thing that you sort of see. So I could have used this to run the city, the lower, the lower reaches of the city of making. But it wasn't out yet. And so I didn't, so I didn't. But I might now, I might have, if, if I was doing it again, I would probably do it now. 
So it's pretty cool. So another interesting thing is there's, uh, you know, if you're, if you're not aware, Wizards of the Coast is producing a D&D Magic the Gathering set. And as we also know, there have been now a few Magic the Gathering D&D campaign books. So they're definitely starting that MTG D&D overlap, right? And I think it's fine, right? I think people can get sort of cynical about it. Like, oh, you know, they're, they're passing business back and forth and stuff like that. But like, who cares, right? Like, you know, I talk, I think I talked before about how to enjoy the Magic the Gathering books more by just not thinking of them as Magic the Gathering books. So, you know, it could be pretty cool. But anyway, one other benefit is that they've been putting out some free stuff. So one of the things they've been doing to promote the new Magic the Gathering D&D set is they put out an adventure called In Scarlet Flames. I will paste the URL. It is hard to find. I knew they had done it and I had to dig. So the URLs, again, URLs in the notes below if you're watching on YouTube and I'm pasting them into the chat here. But it is a PDF adventure. Excellent, you know, beautiful design, right? Cool kind of things. And it all has to do with like hunting down the Red Wizards of Thay in a big dungeon. I don't know that there's a lot of magic stuff in here. I think this is more to kind of like show the D&D stuff to the Magic the Gathering group, right? What's interesting is that it's a high level adventure. It's an eighth level adventure. So it's not low level. And my friend Teos Abadia and Sean Merwin were talking about this on Mastering Dungeon, the Mastering Dungeons podcast. And they said that might be because they want to show some of the iconic monsters and you can't really show some of the iconic monsters if you're doing low level stuff. But it seemed odd to do a series of adventures starting at eighth level, but people don't mind. Now, the other one is this could sit right, you could you could run this right after you ran Dragon of Ice Fire Peak from the D&D Essentials kit. So that might be another thing. So there's a red wizard adventure, you know, you're hunting down red wizards, really cool stuff, basic dungeon delve. I think my only argument is that the map, you know, all this production value and really good looking stuff. And then you get to the map and it's kind of like hand-drawn black and white grid map. And I think they could have done a better job with the map if you ask me. I like the side view a lot. That's really cool, but I don't know. So there are, and they're doing, I guess, three of these. So the price is right. It's free right? You go get a free, go get a free adventure. So yeah, so that's cool. And then the other part of that is they offer up some characters. Here is the, so this page has a whole bunch of stuff about it. I'll paste this. The new Forgotten Realms, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms magic set. And if you go down to the bottom of here, and I'll link to them directly too, they have character sheets and the character sheets are all for plane, plane walker, the planes walkers, right? And we had some discussion on my Discord about the design of these things, but I kind of dig the design. I think it's okay that they don't look exactly like a normal one. And I love the like art overtaking the, the, the pic, you know, art overtaking the, the, the character sheet. I think that's a really cool design. So they look really neat. Art is really great. And these are 10th level characters, which you're like, why are you releasing 10th level characters for plane walkers? And then an eighth level adventure. And I'm pretty sure that the eighth level adventure isn't expecting a bunch of plane walkers. You know, but it's each of the, I don't know, you know, somebody says, oh, you get to play as Narset. I'm like, I guess, I don't know who that is, right? There are five, six, five or six of them, I guess five. So yeah, 10th level characters, maybe it's only four. No, it's five. Yeah, right. Monk five, wizard five. I don't know if that's a good combo or not. And uh, so, but again, yeah, price is right. They're free. Right. So I thought that was really cool. I thought that was a neat thing. I don't know if I like would run it or anything, but like, Hey, for a free adventure, go download it, steal what you like, you know, keep, keep, keep what you dig, toss what you don't. It's really cool. So Alter Rick River says, do you, did you see that the idea of cutting out all magic cards to make D and D tokens? I thought it was a full, I thought, I assume you're saying a cool idea, cool idea for magic. Yes, I've done it. So I have a video and an article. I actually just updated the article on lazy token save. So I have a article here. Oops, you guys can't see that. So I'm in the wrong window. So I have an article called Cra Creating, Crafting Lazy Monster Tokens for D&D. And I did this because I wanted to help people create a set of inexpensive tokens that they could use for all of their D&D games to help, support, to help support any games they run and be able to play the game only spending about 30 bucks. And the 30 bucks is most of that money is spent on a one inch hole puncher, which is 10 bucks and, you know, adhesive magnets, which are also like 10 bucks. But basically you need four things. A one inch hole puncher, one inch epoxy stickers, which are cheap, uh, a glue stick. Uh, you don't need a glue stick. I can actually take the glue. I'm going to take the glue stick out. You don't need the glue stick and adhesive magnets, right? One inch, one inch adhesive magnets. And what you do is you print out 
tokens on a sheet. In this case, I have this generic sheet of tokens, right? With a bunch of different kinds. You print this out on nice quality paper and you punch them out with the one inch hole punch. You put the one inch epoxy sticker on one side, you put the magnet on the bottom and you have a really nice professional feeling token that will last forever and uh, can basically represent just about any monster that you needed to represent in any battle. And you can do abstract combat with it. You can just do, you know, like ordering of like, what's the marching order? You can, you know, but one, one thing that people talk about is you can also get art that's better than this, you know, or, or more specific than this. And some, what some people have been doing is they take old magic cards and then they punch out old magic cards and create them. And you can actually go and buy like really dirt cheap magic cards at like your local game shop for all the dregs that nobody wants and make tokens. The hard part is they're a little hard to see. So I've done it before, but they're a little hard to see. And that has gotten in the way of that's that's gotten in the way. But you could do it for character tokens, like you know, and probably better than going and doing it to magic cards. I would just print out the art on a color printer if you can, like especially photo quality paper and a color printer, inkjet printer. You can print any art that you can find on the internet, and you can scale it to size, punch it out with a token, and then stick it in a token. Now you got a pro token, and you can do that for all the characters because each of the character tokens, it would make sense that they look a certain way. You could even take the art off of like a D and D Beyond character sheet, turn that into a token. So it's a real, it's a cool, you know, it's a cool thing. I recommend it. So I talked about my horde rules before. I did a video about them. I have uh, some notes on Sly Flourish about them for running for running hordes, right? And basically the running horde thing comes down to two main components. Uh, component number one is that you tally damage done to the horde overall, not to each individual monster. And then every time the horde takes damage equal to the hit points of a monster, you remove a monster or one or more, depending on how much damage they've taken, right? So you basically just have one hit point pool, that one, one hit point tally, a damage tally. It's not even about tracking hit points, it's about tracking damage. You have one damage tally, and let's say you've got 25, let's say you have 50 skeletons, right? You give each skeleton 10 hit points. And every time the damage tally takes 10, damage one of the skeletons is thrown away if it takes 20 or 30 points of damage three skeletons are thrown away right and that way you don't have to track multiple hit points for different kinds of monsters all at once the other question though is what about adjudicating the attacks that they make or the saving throws that they make and my my answer has been assume one quarter of them succeed so if you are attacked by 10 skeletons you can assume two of them hit you, you round down so you assume two of them hit you and you take 10 points of damage right Easy, easy peasy way of, of, of handling it. If 20 skeletons are hit by a fireball, they're all going to die anyway. But let's say 20 ogres are hit by a fireball, right? How many of them are going to die? And how many of them are going to survive the, the, the blast? And you might say, okay, if 20 of them are hit, five of them are going to save. The rest of them are going to take the full damage. And it's probably easier to say all three fourths of the ogres are destroyed by the fireball and one quarter su survives the attack, right? So... That one quarter rule works well, but when you're taking it, when you're inflicting attacks upon characters, it's, they can, you know, the players can get kind of jaded about like, why do I automatically get hit, right? Why, you know, there, there, was, there was probabilities in there. And what we're saying is, yeah, there's probabilities, but we're rounding the probabilities down, just basically saying a quarter of them succeed. But if you wanted to roll for it, I have another, another way of doing it. It's a little more complicated than the one quarter succeed rule, but it's not too terrible. So basically what you do is, let's say you're getting attacked by 10 skeletons. You're gonna assume, so you, instead of assuming that a quarter of them succeed, you roll two attack rolls for all 10 skeletons, right? And you use the attack bonus that the skeleton has. And on each hit, they take one quarter of the damage of the total amount of monsters that we're attacking. So in this case, skeletons do five points of damage. You're attacked by 10, the total is 50. So each quarter would do 12 points of damage, right? And so you would roll two attack rolls doing 12 damage each hit if they hit. If, they, if neither of them hit, they take zero. If both hit, they take 24 points of damage. If, they, if one hits, they take 12, right? So it, it makes it swingier because they could get a hit by as many as half of them instead of a quarter. And, but then swinging the other direction that they might take zero. It still applies an attack roll. It still makes sense for the armor class of the of the of the character and you still are rolling for dice so it's still it, it adds in probabilities and it's not too hard to figure out right if you can say like you're getting attacked by you know 12 archers right and and the archers are doing four damage each 
that's 12, 24, 36, 48 points, right? And so I mean, that's easy, right? It's 12, 12 damage per hit. You roll two hits, two attacks, 12 damage per hit to see if you get hit. So it's a little faster. But then you also might say, you know, it, so it adds back dice to the equation and it, it adds some swinginess back in. A quarter per hit is a lot, but because they have a good chance of taking zero, because it's often weak monsters against strong characters. And then sh things like shield matter and stuff like that. So so that's a, not a terrible way to go. It, it takes a little bit more head math to operate than the one quarter succeed, but it's not terrible, right? But the reality is like the one quarter succeed is still easier to do. It's still faster. If you're rubbing around the table and you got lots of monsters, you might do it that way. And then the other time is a lot of times uh, because of circumstances, you're not going to get attacked by 10, even if you're fighting 50 guys, you know, you're not going to have 20 of them attacking one character all at once. It's usually going to be a handful, like six, eight, 10. And maybe in those cases, you just roll the attack rolls, right? Just roll them like you would normally. It really depends on like how many attack rolls do you want to roll? If it's getting burdensome, and you're saying like, I got to roll eight attack rolls and, or they have multiple attacks. Oh my God. Like you're getting attacked by, you know, 10 thugs, right? And the thugs do five damage per hit and they do two attacks and they have advantage. Oh God, how do I, how do I adjudicate that? Well, the answer is you say, okay, they do 10 damage each. There's 10 of them. That's 50 points of damage. No, hundred points of damage. Quarter of that is 25 points per hit. And they have advantage. Thugs are going to hurt when they roll. So then you roll two attacks each one at advantage, 25 damage per hit. If you're getting attacked by 10 thugs, you're in a bad, you're having a bad day. Thugs are hard. So, so it's another option. It's another little tool you can keep in your head. I think it kind of works well. And I, and I, and I, and I kind of dig it. That is all I had to talk about today. What other, any other topics that people want to talk about? I got, you know, five or 10 minutes to, to chat about anything. Is there any, anything that's happened in the industry? Anything that's coming up? Man, it's rare for me to end this show early. You know, what, what, what have people got going on? Right. So Snark Knight says, I want to see Mike Shea run the bride in the, in the crazy 88. That's exactly what this is about, right? That scene is awesome, right? And Kill Bill, when the bride is fighting, you know, 88, and they're like, well, there's not really 88 of them. They just call themselves that because it sounded cool. Matt Colville is talking about his own RPG. I, I have, I've heard him make noise like that. Yes. So, right, but that idea of like one character, like the bride fighting 88 people, the way you do that is minion rules, right? You see her, she's swinging her blades around and people's arms and legs are falling off. So, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. So we have at least two major, well, so let's, if, let's presume he's doing one, Matt Colville, right? And I think it's a safe presumption. He's certainly considering it. That means we would have like two forks of 5e coming out. And I think we already have some, but like we already have level up, which is the end world the N world fork of five E coming out too. They're calling that like advanced five E, right? So, you know, this is a, you know, in coming in 2021, that's interesting, but they already have like, look at that, right? I mean, that's a pretty, you know, pretty interesting. And they're, they're taking a whole kind of different look and apparently it's backward compatible. So that's pretty cool. Well, you know, I, I'm eager, I, you know, I think it'll be pretty cool to see what other takes of five E look like. Right, I think that that is pretty cool, and uh, they've done a lot of playtesting and level up. So yeah, so I think that that's cool. Matt Colville, we'll see. I mean, you know, I think it'd be cool. I think so. I think Matt Colville and I have different ideas about what kind of things we want to focus on in a D and D game. He is certainly a more tactical player than I am. He certainly thinks about the mechanics of monsters and the mechanical characters more than than, than I care to. And I know that his sort of newfound love for five E for four E would probably go in there. And then the big question is. Would they be doing abstract combat or not? Because I'll tell you, for me, the new make or break for an RPG is if it doesn't have built-in rules for handling abstract combat, I'm not really that interested, right? Fate Forge is a 5e variant with some changes, not too drastic though. Yeah, there's a lot of small ones, Five Torches Deep, a lot of like sort of classic, classic versions of D&D, &D, but those are relatively small. It's rare to see some like this that are this big, you know? So Colville has started planning on a 5e monster book. That could also be really cool. And that one I think I would like better i don't know i mean we have to depend on the system i would love to see a 13th age for 5e that's what i really want i want i love 13th age and i would love to see a 5e-ish version of 13th age particularly with the focus on abstract combat and sort of removal of skills and creation of background based proficiency so like because you're a smith you have advantage on or you have uh, your proficiency bonus on this check I think you can make some really, a really streamlined version of 5e 
with a couple of changes that would be pretty cool and i think 13th age has has a lot of that formula a lot of that formula in it what else somebody brought something up have i talked about i have not heard about the dungeons of drakenheim i think i looked at it i don't remember why i didn't get it or why what i i did why it didn't register let's take a look oh they got an ad they're paying for advertisement Half a million dollars, uh, almost 6,000 backers. 5e Adventure and Malevolent Monsters. Uh, who is doing this? Who is the publisher? Where does it say? I, you know, I'll tell you one thing. Like, funded in five minutes. I don't care. I don't know why people advertise it. Oh, the Dungeon Dudes one. Yeah, I have I have heard of this one. And isn't it in partnership with somebody? Is this in partnership with uh, Ghostfire or Nord or somebody? I think. It looks cool. I, I know what it was. And when, when I hit a price point of $25 for a PDF, that, you know, that's where I'm kind of like, you know, I guess I'll kind of see when it comes out. It's just enough. Yeah, Ghostfire Games. Okay. I should pick it up just because I love Sean. $25 for a PDF is a lot. Is it, is it, now $25 is not, like, think about Empire of the Ghouls. It's 300 and some pages. It's $20. I think when you, when you, when you cross over that $20 threshold for me, I'm not right or wrong, right? I'm not, I'm not judging and I'm not saying it should be cheap or anything like that. But I know for me, that's kind of when I start to get more, it looks nice. This isn't so bad, right? The Dungeons of Drakenheim PDF download hardcover and fabric map for 55 bucks. See, that's, that's a pretty good deal. So is it $25 Canadian? No. Is that right? I'm pretty sure that's $25. You. This looks like a pretty good deal. Right. That that could be that could be pretty neat. But I'm 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 familiar with Dungeon Dudes, but I don't know that I've seen anything they've done before. Look at all the stuff. Miniatures. This is where it gets crazy. I'll tell you, you're not gonna see Sly Flourish miniatures. You know, or Sly Flourish dice boxes. That's not that's not likely to happen. Mine are my my I like to keep my life simple. Yeah, it's US dollars. So I think that that, that fifty five dollar one, because what, that's thirty dollars more? And you get a hardcover book and a fabric map for 30 bucks more. That seems like a better deal. What does this come with? Yeah, I don't need dice. I don't need card decks. So this this one this one looks like the good deal. So I, I I'll probably back this project. You know, do I really need more books on my shelf? I don't know. But but Ghostfire makes really cool stuff. So wait, Sly Kickstarter? Yes. I'm gonna be in a shocker. I've only done seven. Yes, I'm going to do another Kickstarter. Probably later this summer, early fall. We'll see. I'd love it to be this summer. But we're waiting for we're waiting for the assets. Thank you very much for hanging out with me today to talk about all things D&D. It's always a great pleasure to hang out and chat, and I appreciate it. If you want to help me out, you can do so in four ways. You can subscribe to the Sly Flourish newsletter. You can subscribe to me on YouTube. You can help support me on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash slyflourish, or you can pick up my books, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, The Lazy DM Workbook, Runes of the Grand Root, Fantastic Lairs, or any of my other books. But Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master and The Lazy DM's Workbook tend to be the uh, most popular ones, and I think you will enjoy them. So thank you very much for coming today, for watching the show today, and get out there and play some D&D.